Good morning. Welcome to ABC Adult Bible Class at New Life Community Church in Fair Oaks, California. Wherever you happen to be, join us today for our Sunday class time. Actually, it's Friday when we're recording this, and you will be able to watch it the rest of today or from now on. And we trust that it will be a blessing to you. Let's sing our my theme song. Come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord and bless the Lord. This is Labor Day weekend and uh, it's of course a, a holiday that we look forward to every year and I thought I would read just a little bit about Labor Day. Some of you may say what's it all about? First Labor Day was held in 1882 and its origins stem from the central labor union's desire to create a holiday for workers. It became a federal holiday in 1894. So it's been around a long time. Originally it was intended that the day would be filled with a street parade to allow the public to appreciate the trade and labor organizations work. After the parade, a festival was to be held to amuse local workers and their families. In later years, prominent men and women had speeches. <laughs> this says, this is less common now, but is sometimes seen in election years. I would guess that it will be seen this year. One of the reasons for choosing to celebrate this on the first Monday in September, and not on May 1st, which is common in the rest of the world, was to add a holiday in the long gap between Independence Day in July and Thanksgiving in November. So we have Labor Day, first Monday in September. Trust that it will be a blessed time for you, even in these days of COVID. And in mind with Labor Day, I thought it would be good to sing the same song that I sang last week. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I want to mention that a little later, Glenn will be teaching this morning that he will be serving communion and you may want to find the elements to share with us as we come to that point in the service and just wanted to let you know and with the communion in mind i'd like to sing this song which talks about the cross and may it be a <clears throat> A time that we will begin to think even now of what Jesus has done for us. Yeah. On the cross crucified, in great sorrow he died. The giver of life was he. Yet my Lord was despised and rejected of men this jesus of calvary he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised 
for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. Price for healing was paid, as those cruel stripes were made within Pilate's judgment hall. Now his suffering affords perfect healing for all. This wonderful healer's mind. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. It occurs to me before we go to the third verse, many times in Riverside, as we call people for prayer in the prayer lines and we anointed them with oil, we would be singing this song and people would leave their seats and come down and form a line uh, behind the, the staff pastors. Let me suggest, no, you're not in the chapel here with us today. You may be in your living room or your kitchen or bed, wherever. As we sing this third verse and chorus, would you join us at the throne, at, at the altar? and bring your need, bring your desire. If you're, if you're having a, 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 hit, a healing problem, if there's something you need touched in your body or in one of your families, would you, as we sing this, if, as if we were in the church, go to the altar of your own home and bring your request and believe the Lord for it. He has healed my sick soul, made me every went whole, and he'll do the same for you. He's the same yesterday and today and for a this healer of men today. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows, and by his stripes we are When we were able to have class, at this point, Donna would come up and you would give your prayer requests. And someone would lead in prayer over those prayer requests and, and we would put the list on the screen. And always at the bottom of the screen, we had two things that were always there. One was prayer for unsaved loved ones. The other was unspoken requests. And I have at various times tried to emphasize the importance 
of unspoken requests. And that's really where we're at now because we are, are spread all over the city. There are individuals watching this who are literally spread around the world. And we don't know the details of their requests, but they have needs, even as you do. And we need to learn to pray for unspoken requests. As, as you think of, for instance, Lila, you can pray and say, Lord, my sister Lila, would you minister to her today? Lord, you know her needs. And you can pray for her without knowing exact details. I think sometimes it's, it's almost detrimental to know the details because we're so prone when we do know the details that we start giving God the recipe for how to fix it. Someone has cancer and and you start telling the Lord about, well, our pastor went down and had the proton treatment. Lord, make it possible for... The Lord doesn't need our advice. He knows better how to do it. Do you remember how many ways he healed blind people? I think it's five people that he healed who were blind. Never used the same method twice. Always a new way. And the Lord has new ways today. I think the prayer that I pray more than any other prayer, and it's in Bangala. I, I, it's been so long since we were in Africa, I wonder if my Bangala is exactly correct. But I pray, Mokano na yoe salama, which is the Lord, Lord, have your way. Or sometimes I'll do it in French. And there again, I'm not sure about the French. But volonté na yo. <laughs> I, I, now I'm mixing my Bangala and my French. It doesn't matter. The point is, Lord, have your way. And I would encourage you to pray for all the folks in the class. Pray for them by name. Pray for them that God's will will be done. And there's, there's one particular prayer request this morning that I have that's an unspoken request. It's a very serious unspoken request. I, I don't even know all the details of it, but I do know how to pray, and that is, Lord, have your will be done. And I would ask you to, to join me. You can say, Lord, you know Daryl's unspoken request. Let your will be done in it. And I was thinking about this. And I, in, in watching various messages during the week, I heard someone talk about the jail that Peter was in. And that time that, that he was there doesn't say how many days he was there. And the church was continually praying. And the night before, Herod was going to come get him out and maybe kill him because they just killed James and that seemed to be popular with the Jews. An angel came and released him. And you can read all about it in, in Acts 12. And when he got to the house where they were having the prayer meeting, he knocked on the door and said, let me in. And the little girl who came, she, she ran and said, Peter's outside. <laughs> and they said, no, you're delirious. He's, he's not here, he's in jail. They've been praying. And when he got out, they didn't believe it. Because they had been giving God a prescription for what he should do. Lord, I pray you would strike Herod dead. Lord, would you cause Peter to have the strength to, to sustain this? And, and Lord, prepare him for, for assassination like James and, and telling the Lord all the stuff to do. And turns out the Lord didn't do it any of the ways that they were prescribing. And so they were surprised when God did it his own way. 
And so when you pray, you're better off to pray, Lord, let your will be done. Than for you to try to tell the Lord, well, now, Lord, this happened to that person. And if you do it that way, it'll work fine. He's got a better way. Like with the five blind people that he healed, each time it was different. And he'll do it different in your circumstances. He'll do it different in the circumstances of the person that you're praying for. But it'll always be the best way if you commit it to him for his will to be done. And the scripture on the screen is right. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And if we will just commit it to him and say, Lord, have your way. Nothing is impossible. God can do it in the best way. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning with, with our requests. We have a huge basket of requests. We just don't know what it says on each request. But you do. And Lord, you know the perfect solution. And sometimes it's a question of, of an answer where the answer should be no. And you know how to provide that. Sometimes the answer is to wait. And you know how to provide that. And yes, you know how to give that yes answer and, and bring about things that were considered impossible. But with you, nothing is impossible. And Lord, I bring this request that that I'm asking people to especially pray for today and in the days ahead. Lord, may your perfect will be done. Intervene in that situation. I pray for your peace in that situation. I pray for your provision in that situation. I pray for, for healing in that situation. And Lord, I commit it to you and trust you to perform your perfect will. Lord, we're not going to try to guess what it is. We simply bring it to you and lay it at the altar. We've come as we sang the song and, and, and we've come as it were to our spiritual altar there in our home and we lay it on the altar and we commit it to you today for your perfect will to be accomplished. Lord, we would not give you the prescription today, but we would commit it to you. And now, Lord, I pray that your anointing will be on Brother Glenn as he ministers to us. Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak through him to all of us who are watching this video. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Today we're going to do communion together, and, and I thought maybe this would be a good opportunity to, to share with you some thoughts uh, about that section of scripture that we go to when we uh, when we deal with communion. Uh, let's turn to, if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. And let's, let's just ask the Lord's blessing on this. Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would bless these words, Lord. Open your word to us today, Lord. Give us some new insights, Lord. Give us some new understandings. And bless what we do today, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who came to die for our sins, that we might be forgiven and be able to enter into your holy presence and to, uh, to live eternally with you, Father, in a heavenly place, in a glorious place. So we give you praise today, Father, and we thank you for your anointing and your holy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's uh, start at verse 23. What is your <clears throat> reference again? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. 
and, and, and Paul is writing, he wrote the first Corinthians, he did, he wrote a lot of the New Testament under the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so it start, he starts out here, uh, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. I've always thought this was a, a, a very interesting start, a very interesting phrase where he says, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. Now, this is kind of a, a, a phrase that we, we easily read through and we just kind of go on. We don't stop and consider. But think about it. Paul wasn't one of the original disciples. He didn't spend any time with the Lord when the Lord was on the earth. Uh, and so if, if he had said, for I received from Peter that which I delivered to you, we would accept that just fine. That would be okay. But he didn't say that. And, and he says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. Well, when did he receive it from the Lord? How did this happen? Because as you'll see, he goes on to relate the words that Jesus said at the Last Supper. He wasn't there. What an interesting thing. So he received from the Lord, he says, that which I delivered to you. What a, what a fascinating scripture that is. Let's look over to chapter uh, 6 of the book of Acts for a moment. In Acts chapter 6, we find that, that Paul, who at that time was referred to as Saul. In Acts chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 8. Acts chapter 6, get my fingers to work here. The pages of my Bible have become so thin from use. In Acts chapter 6, verse 8, uh, and Stephen, full of faith, let's go back to verse uh, 6. No, we'll go back, to, we'll stay at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen was a man of God that, that God used mightily to, to spread, spread the, the news of the gospel and to heal and do miraculous things were done and the Jewish, Jews, the Jewish hierarchy caught wind of this and said this is something we got to stop and so they put their best foot forward and, and got a hold of him and let's look over to, to chapter 8 and let's go to uh, verse 59 chapter 7 verse 59 uh, he was ministering and they, they got a hold of, of him and took him before the Sanhedrin, which was the court, the Jewish court at the time. And, uh, and he had a lot to say when they were questioning him about what he was doing. Well, they got upset with him, very upset with him, and they stoned him, verse 59 of chapter 7. Uh, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is an idiom for saying he died. Verse 8, chapter 1, now Saul was consenting to his death. Saul was right there. He couldn't stand these Christians, and so he was consenting. He was in agreement with what was going on with Stephen. And at that time, great persecution rose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now think about this for a moment. Maybe you're sitting with some friends at round the table in the kitchen and you're having a cup of coffee and maybe a maybe a, 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 a little cake of some kind and you're fellowshipping and you're reading the Bible together, all of a sudden men show up outside, they knock down your door, they come in, they handcuff you and take you out, throw you in the cars and away you go to jail for reading the word of God. That's what Saul was doing to the church. It was causing all kinds of problems. Well, the Lord knew very well what was going on and he knew that he had a plan for Saul. Let's go over to, uh, let's go over to chapter, uh, let's see. 
chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Let's read that. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to, to the synagogues at the, of Damascus so that if he found any that were in the way, meaning any Christians, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice calling out to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, Well, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goad was a long pointed stick that farmers would use and it often had a metal point on it. And, and it was used by the farmers as they were plowing the fields with an ox or a cow or whatever. Uh, maybe the cow wouldn't want to go. It stopped and refused to proceed. They'd take the goad and they'd stick the, the goad in the rear end of the, of the cow to, to give them a little motivation to keep going. So you can't kick against the gold. You're going you're gonna to be the result. You're going to be the worse off for it. So that's what the Lord said. Isn't it hard for you to kick against the gold? Isn't it hard for you to resist something you can't resist? And, and so he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, well, arise and go into the city and you'll, you'll, uh, you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but not seeing anybody. Obviously, they were quite astounded. So Saul rose up from the ground, and, and his eyes were, when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He opened his eyes, but he was blind. He couldn't see. Then they led him by the hand and brought him to, to Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank he was messed up God had got to hold him in such a powerful way everything about his life up to that point was utter confusion he had no idea what in the world is going on with me well God had prepared a man named Ananias let's read verse 10 and now there are certain was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the, and the, and the Lord said to him, Arise. And go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house for Judas, the one for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming to him and, and, and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Well, Ananias wasn't particularly excited about this because he knew the stories about Saul. So he talked to the Lord about that, but pretty soon, okay, the Lord reassured him. And so verse 17, Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. All right. And immediately there fell from his eyes uh, something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And then, when, and then, and when he had, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul sent, spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Well, verse 20. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. What a shock for the people that knew Saul all of a sudden, what, is, what do they see him doing? He's in the synagogues, not getting warrants to arrest Christian people. He's preaching the same Jesus the rest of the Christians are talking about. His life had been absolutely, totally, and utterly transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. God had a plan for him, and God's got a plan for you and a plan for me. Praise God. And we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, that we can accomplish that which God calls us to do as well. So, who taught Paul? How did, how did he get his information? Let's go over to Galatians chapter 3. Beginning verse, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1. Beginning verse 11 and 12. Now, here's, 
here he is, Paul, his name is now changed to Paul. He says, but I make known to you, brethren, this again is Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I received it from man, I, I received it, for I neither received it from man nor was taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he very clearly says here, all that I have learned, nobody taught me. I learned it by the revelation of Jesus. Jesus taught me. Now go to verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I... <coughs> Excuse me. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he spent three years in Damascus after he was transformed, after he was called by God and, and born again. Three years in Damascus studying the word of God and, and spending time alone with the Lord. And the Lord himself taught him and revealed these, all these things to him. He spent three years there before he did before. Then he went up to Jerusalem for 15 days, spent some time with Peter and also uh, James the Lord's brother and then he came, went back to Damascus again and verse two, uh, chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 says then after 14 years 14 years so when you read the book of Acts it's easy to think that if you read the whole book all together all at one time you think oh that probably happened over a period maybe a 3 or 4 year period no it all occurred over about a 30 year period of time so here so Paul gets saved, gets transformed, filled with the Holy Spirit. For three years, he preaches in the synagogue, the Jewish synagogues there in Damascus, and he spends time with the Lord, and the Lord downloaded into him incredible amounts of information. And then, after, after three years, he spends 15 days up in Jerusalem, then he goes back to Damascus, and he spends 14 years ministering around in the Damascus area, ministering and, 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 and doing what he could there. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and he also took Titus with him. And verse 2, he says, And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, so let's, let's, let's stop there. So at this point then, he had not only ministered to the, in the synagogues as he could, but he was also ministering to Gentiles. The gospel has been opened up to you and me. Because I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish. And if you're a Gentile, you can be saved as well. You can have your life transformed. We are... We are now eligible to be grafted into the family of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. So he went back to Damascus and waited 14 years before going again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is still teaching his people today. He spent quite a bit of time, he spent quite a bit of time with Paul, preparing Paul to, to be a full-time minister of the gospel and, to, and preparing him to give all kinds of insights to us as he wrote most of the New Testament. But he's still teaching his people today. And if you seek the Lord as you read the word, God will reveal things to you. You will get insights about the word of God. 
and God will surprise you with things. It's amazing. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we started off. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. When? When he was in Damascus, after he had been saved, after he had been called by God. He received all that information while he was in Damascus during that time. So, that the, so here he continues on. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new uh, covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So this communion time is a celebration of the death of the Lord Jesus. His death is the final sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, yours and mine included. When Jesus was starting out, he went to the Jordan River and he found John the Baptist baptizing people into a baptism of repentance. And as Jesus walked up there toward John, where John the Baptist was baptizing, John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, <clears throat> the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, not just covered up. In the Old Testament, sins were covered up, but the blood of, a, of an animal was sacrificed. And in, in a symbolic way, that blood covered their sin. So God didn't have to look at it. It was covered. But now today, our sins are not just covered up. They're completely washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise God. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Amen. A wonderful thing. That we can have our sins totally and completely and absolutely forgiven by Almighty God. And it makes us acceptable in His sight. He looks, looks down at me and He doesn't see Glenn the sinner anymore. He sees Glenn, the man that was been, has been washed and cleansed by his, the precious blood of His Son Jesus, so that I have no longer a sinful man in His presence. I couldn't get to His presence. Sin can't enter into heaven. But now, because I've been cleansed, I'm acceptable to God. Not because I'm perfect. Not because I'm holy. Not because I'm righteous. I'm none of those things on my own, but through the, through the working of the Holy Spirit of God and the application of the blood of Jesus Christ to my soul, I'm cleansed and acceptable to Almighty God. And so are you, if you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. So that's a good question. Have you asked the Lord Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive your sins? Have you asked him? Have you made that formal statement of him? For our confession goes along with our belief, our faith. Our confession is made unto salvation. Maybe you've been a believer a long time, but you've never confessed Jesus as your personal Savior. You've got to do the confession. Believing is really important. No doubt about it. But along with the believing is the receiving. We must individually, each of us, receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Confessing him out loud with our mouth. That yes, I'm in need of a Savior. Yes, I need to be saved. Yes, I want to be a part of the family of God. And I accept you, Jesus, into my life. Well, if you've never done that, maybe you'd like to do it today before we have our communion together. If so, let's pray this prayer with me, would you please? Jesus, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I'm in need of a Savior. I'm in need of a Savior. And I need to be saved so I can be acceptable in your sight. I need to be saved to be acceptable in your sight. So today, Lord Jesus, I confess to you I am a sinner. I confess to you today that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. 
I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And Jesus, I receive you right now as my personal Savior. I receive you right now as my personal Savior. And I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to come into me. I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to come into me. And transform me. And transform me. That I might be a part of your family. That I might be part of your family. Not just a believer. Not just a believer. But a receiver of Jesus Christ. a receiver Christ. of Jesus Christ. Myself. Myself. Right now. Right now. So I believe that's what you're doing. I believe that's what you're doing. And I accept it by faith. I accept it by faith. And I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Father God. For sending Jesus for me. For sending Jesus for me. Amen. Well, Amen. all right. Now, if you're prepared to receive communion, if you're ready, let's do it, shall we? Let's go back to, up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's read it again and let's enter in, shall we? Paul says, For I received of the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. So get out your bread. Maybe you have a cracker or just a little wafer like one of these. And we had given thanks, he broke it. So let's, I'm going to break it, break it. And said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In Isaiah 53, we realize, we, we read that by his stripes, we are healed. So if you need healing, just say, Lord, I'm, I'm in need of healing today. It's, a, it's, it's, it's there for you. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's there for me. Nobody enters heaven maimed, sick, diseased, or broken. When we come it comes time for us to enter into heaven, you're going to be whole and well and complete. And you can be whole and well and complete even today before you get there. So we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. And then when he had given thanks, he broke and said, take and eat. Okay, we've done that. In the same manner, verse 25, he also took the cup after supper. So they ate supper. Then he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it for in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So let's, let's take the cup together. It's the new covenant. It's the symbol of the new covenant in his blood. A new relationship, a new understanding, a new legal standing with God in the blood of Jesus. So let's drink it together. Praise the Lord. Let's just take a moment and praise the Lord. Shall we together? Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you today thank you, Jesus. for what you did for us. I thank you for what you did for me and what you're continuing to do. For when I do a little oops, I bring it to you and say, Lord, I, I messed up again. Forgive me for that and help me, Lord, not to do that again. Help me, Lord, to live a life of righteousness by the power of your Holy Spirit through me. And I thank you today, Lord Jesus, for, for saving my soul. Thank you for this new covenant that makes me eligible. And I praise you, Lord Jesus. And we're going to continue to celebrate this until he comes. And he will come. He may come today. He may come for you today. He may come for me today. He may come for all of us today. But he will come. My great-grandmother, as she was dying in 1952... She was laying in bed, dying, and her family was all around her. And all of a sudden, she sat up, and she looked up, and she said, Jesus, I knew you'd come. And she fell back dead in body, but alive in the spirit, and went to be with the Lord. He came for her. He's going to come for you one of these days, and he's going to come for me one of these days. And he may come for all of us at the same time. Wouldn't that be glorious? what we call the catching away of the church, the rapture of the church. It may be close. Well, that'd be wonderful. But I thank you, Lord, today for what you've done and what you're doing. And I give you praise. And we, Lord, all who are participating in this today, we thank you and praise you for what you have done, what you're doing, 
and what you're going to complete in us, Lord, that we might be totally acceptable and used by you to touch others' lives, Lord, while we're still on this earth. And one day we're going to be with you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name. Amen. Glory to God. May God bless you, and I hope, uh, I hope you have a great day today and the rest of the week, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation. So...